thank you for joining our online service in Living Word IT Park. You may join us every Sunday at 10 a.m. for our English service. You may also give your love offering through online bank transfer or over-the-counter direct deposit. Bank details are shown on the screen.
Good morning, church. I'm glad you could join us once again. As you all know, last week we concluded our series on the book of Jonah. And today we begin a new series on the book of James. And our scripture text is taken from James chapter 1, verse 1 to 4. And so if you have your Bibles with you, please turn it with me to James chapter 1. The Word of God says, James, a servant of God, 
and of the Lord Jesus Christ to the twelve tribes in the dispersion, greetings. Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness, and let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for how you have guided us in our Jonah series. Thank you for the things that we have learned. And as we begin a new series, Lord, as we study the book of James, I pray that you would show us, Lord God, your heart, your desire for us to be transformed into the likeness of Christ. It is my prayer, O God, that these things that we will be learning from James would not just instruct us, but it would transform us as well, that we might be able to live out our faith in this world. So, Father God, we commit to you our series. May you be glorified. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. There's an old story about the famous violinist Fritz Kreisler. I think it illustrates an important point as we begin our series on the book of James. And so let me share this story to you. One day, when he was setting out from Hamburg, Germany to give a concert in London, Fritz Kreisler had an R before his boat sailed. He wandered into a music shop where the owner asked if he might look at the violin Chrysler was holding. He then vanished and returned with two policemen, one of whom told the violinist, you are under arrest. What for? asked Chrysler. You have Fritz Chrysler's violin, the owner said. I am Fritz Chrysler, protested the musician. No, you're not. Come along, they said. As Chrysler's boat was sailing soon, there was no time for prolonged explanations. And so Chrysler asked for his violin and played a piece he was well known for. Now, are you satisfied? He asked. The policeman let the musician go because he had done what only Fritz Chrysler could do. Similarly, genuine Christians need to do what they are known for doing and what only they can do. In this epistle, James gives us a series of tests by which one may determine whether his faith is genuine or false. And one of the tests that determines this is the way a person responds to trials. You see, our response to trials reveal who we really are and the nature of our faith. Haddon Robinson once gave this word of wisdom, in any situation, what you are determines what you see. What you see determines what you do. Let me say that again. In any situation, what you are determines what you see, and what you see determines what you do. And so in this series, not only will we be challenged to see things from a biblical perspective, but we will also learn how genuine faith operates. James will give us the guiding principles for Christian conduct. And by the way, James is one of the most practical of all epistles. In fact, it is called the Proverbs of the New Testament. And so let's dive into our text and let's start in verse 1. It says, James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, just a word on the author. His name is James, obviously. But the question is, which James is it that wrote this book? Of the four men named James in the New Testament, there are only two candidates for the authorship of this epistle. You have James the Apostle, the brother of John, the son of Zebedee, and you also have James, the half-brother of our Lord Jesus Christ. That is, his half-brother through their mother Mary. Now, the book of Acts informs us that James, the Apostle James, was killed early. 
That was probably around 43 or 44 AD, which most feel is too early for this book. And if that is the case, then that would leave James, the half-brother of our Lord, as the author. And he is a very good candidate, probably the most likely because James becomes a leader in the church very early. In Galatians 2.9, Paul writes that James, along with Peter and John, were reputed to be pillars in the church. He has a very prominent role in the book of Acts. In fact, he presided the council of Jerusalem. You find that in the book of Acts. Now, he describes himself as James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, that makes his greeting particularly interesting because he does not say James, the half-brother of our Lord Jesus Christ, or James, one of the pillars of the early church. Rather, he simply calls himself a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, the Greek word for servant is doulos, and doulos has a much stronger meaning than just choosing to serve someone. It really means that you are bound to that person. They are in ownership of you. And so clearly, James is expressing the humility of his position before the Lord. He's simply a bond slave of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. John Blanchard says, the mark of a great man of God is not that he thinks himself great, but rather that he thinks himself utterly insignificant. Now, I suppose there are both aspects to this. Uh, there is that aspect of humility, as what we saw earlier. And yet, knowing that he is a servant of God and the Lord Jesus gives great dignity to that position. You see, for the Jew, the title servant of God was one of great dignity. It's use of Moses and the Old Testament prophets. And so to be a servant of God was considered to be a great privilege. It carries great honor because it is God, the sovereign of the universe, whom one serves. Now there's another important truth that we can see in verse 1. When James uh, calls himself a slave of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, he not only expresses his humility, but also his faith in Jesus Christ. You see, before he became a servant of God and of Christ, we know James was an unbeliever. He was a skeptic all through our Lord's earthly ministry. In fact, John tells us in John 7, 5, that the Lord's brothers were not believing in him. And in Mark's gospel, it says, when his family heard about this, they went to take charge of him for they said, he is out of his mind. And so in that chapter, they were very skeptical about Jesus. And that verse uh, indicates that they were in unbelief. And you need to understand that it wasn't until after the resurrection that James believed in Jesus as the Messiah. Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 7, that the Lord appeared to James, then to all the apostles. And so he believed. And not only did James believe in Christ, he became one of the leaders in the church of Jerusalem. In fact, James uh, calls Jesus Christ his Lord. And Lord basically means master. It is a title given to Jesus as the Messiah. And I want you to also notice that in this designation, James puts Jesus on par with God. It's a testimony not only to the Lordship of Christ, but also to His divinity. By mentioning God and Jesus Christ on equal terms and adding Lord, the Old Testament word for God, to Jesus, James clearly affirms the deity of Christ. And so James's view of his half-brother Jesus had undergone quite a transformation since the day they grew up in the same household together. 
he was convinced that Jesus is the Son of God and that He is the Messiah. And so while James could have pulled rank by opening his letter, James, the half-brother of the Lord Jesus Christ, could have said, I grew up with him, I knew him before he was famous. But he didn't do that. He opened his letter by calling himself a bond slave of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so for James, what qualified him to write such a letter was not his physical relationship to Jesus, but his spiritual relationship to him. And I, I believe all of us could identify with James. You see, James is clearly humbled by the fact that Jesus Christ died for him, even though he did not believe in him at first. See, before we got saved, uh, we probably knew things about God and about Jesus, but we did not really believe in him. We did not really put our faith in him and we did not trust that He is the one who could save us from our sins. Maybe we were trusting our religion, our good works, or even if we professed faith in Jesus Christ, uh, our lives clearly did not indicate that we were true followers of Christ. In fact, Paul says this in Colossians chapter 1, verse 21, Once you were alienated from God, and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior. But now He has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in His sight without blemish and free from accusation. That is the good news of the gospel. The reason why God sees us as righteous, without blemish and free from from accusation, despite the many, many sins we have committed in the past, is because of the righteousness of Christ that has been imputed upon us. That's the reason why we are saved. That's the reason why James uh, became a servant of God. He did not earn it. He did not deserve it. It was really because of God's saving grace. And Paul says... This is the gospel that you heard and that has been proclaimed to every creature under heaven and of which I, Paul, have become a servant. Now, what are the similarities that we can see from Paul and James? Well, both of them received the saving grace of Jesus Christ. Both of them experienced that grace. And because they experienced that, God led them to become His servants. In other words, those who have truly experienced the saving grace of God will serve Him. They will serve the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what we see here in the case of James and the Apostle Paul. And they do that, they serve the Lord, not because they're trying to merit His love, they're not doing this because they are trying to save themselves. They're doing this because they have already been saved. This is an act of gratitude uh, for what Christ has done for them. Now, have you experienced the saving grace of God? Have you trusted in Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior? Have you been forgiven of your sins? Have you been a recipient of eternal life? If you have, you must be like Paul and James in the sense that you become a servant of Christ. So let me ask you, do you view yourself as a servant of Jesus Christ? Are you living as if you were a true servant of Christ? Or are you indulging your carnal desires, seeking earthly and worldly satisfaction, and not walking in the way of the Lord? Does your life show that you really believe that you're a servant of God? Do your priorities, your agendas show that? Your desire to know Jesus, to love Him, to obey Him in every area of your life. 
does your speech when you are with your workmates or when you are with your friends, does it show that you are a servant of Jesus? You see, James not only calls himself a servant of Christ, but he's able to back it up with a life that is completely devoted to Him and the cause of Christ. So here we see that James is a faithful servant. In fact, he was a loyal and faithful servant to the very end. Uh, James died as a martyr in AD 62, and Clement of Alexandria relates that James was thrown from the pinnacle of the temple and was beaten to death with a club. So we see that James was not only willing to live for Christ, he was also willing to die for him because he was so convinced that Jesus Christ is the Messiah and that he is the Son of God. So we know that James is a genuine servant of Christ from the testimony of his life. So we come to this first verse and we see that the skeptic had become a slave of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, James wrote this letter to the 12 tribes in the dispersion. The letter of James is not addressed to a single church, but to the 12 tribes scattered in the dispersion. Dispersion became a technical name for all the nations outside of Palestine where Jewish people had come to live. Steve Cole notes that some of the readers had probably been members of the church in Jerusalem, but they had been scattered into many locations because of the persecution that arose after the death of Stephen. You find that in Acts chapter 8. And because of anti-Semitism in the Roman Empire, these believers in Christ were often the brunt of hostility, both from the pagan world as well as from their own people. And so word got back to James of some of the difficulties that these Jewish Christians were experiencing. And so as a pastor, James writes to these scattered Jewish believers to make this point. True faith shows itself in practical godly living. And James develops several themes, and one of which is endurance through trials, which will be the focus of our study today. So the people James is writing to had it tough. When they came to Christ, they were hated by their fellow Jews. They were considered cult members. They were called heretics. And we know the opposition, the persecution became very violent. Their fellow Jews persecuted them for proclaiming that Jesus Christ is God and that He is the Messiah. And now that they were scattered abroad, many of them experienced persecution because they were Jews and Christians. Now try to put yourself in the shoes of the original audience of James. You've experienced great loss, great persecution. You probably lost your job perhaps because your boss does not want to identify with a Christian, thinking that if people know that he has a Christian employee, he might lose certain customers or business partners, so you lost your job. Or probably uh, some of your friends or loved ones were killed because of their faith in Jesus Christ. And so life has hit you really hard. And as you read James's letter, his first word to you is, count it all joy. Or consider it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. How would you respond to that? Now, before we question whether his message is practical and realistic when we're going through terrible trials, I want you to know that James is not saying that a Christian must smile all the time even though he is experiencing a lot of trials in life. You see, he is not commanding how one should feel, but rather how one should view or think about his own circumstances. You see, the word consider means to think, count, or regard something based on weighing and comparing of facts. 
It denotes deliberate and careful judgment stemming from external proof, not subjective judgment based on feelings. Thus, James is saying that Christians should consider any given difficult circumstance as pure joy. And so when trials come, and they will, the first thing we need to do is this. We should adopt the radical attitude of counting it all joy. We should have this settled attitude whenever we fall into trials. This is the attitude that we must have when external testing arrives. Notice, James does not say, if you encounter trials. Rather, he says, when you encounter trials. That means it's not an elective. It is a required course in the school of faith. We're not exempt from hard times. You see, if we are faithful in the mission that the Lord has given to us, we will experience persecution. We will experience challenges. If we are pursuing godliness and obedience, if we are seeking to conform to the image of Jesus Christ, then we will struggle with our flesh and with temptation. And we will undergo the sorrows of life. There will be loss of family, loss of friends, sickness, financial setbacks. The list goes on. Remember what Jesus told His disciples in John 16, 33. He said, you will have trouble. In this world, in this present world, you will have trouble. He didn't say you might have trouble, but you will have trouble. Peter also wrote, Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal or trial among you which comes upon you for your testing as though some strange thing were happening to you. Yes, it is true that we can't predict when trials will occur, but we can know that we will experience them. And so one of the wisest things, one of the most practical things that you could do in life is to prepare for them so that you're ready when they come. And the first step to being prepared for trials is to have the right attitude so that when they come, you can see things from a biblical perspective. Unfortunately, many Christians naively think that if they follow the Lord, if they obey the Lord and serve Him, they will be exempt from trials, that they will be spared from trials. And so when trials hit them, they are confused and often angry at God. And they say, Lord, I was following you. I was serving you. Why are you allowing this to happen to me? But the Bible gives abundant testimony that all of God's saints encounter trials. And these trials are not necessarily the consequence of disobedience. That is why in verse 2, James leaves the trials unidentified. He simply describes them as various trials. In other words, he says there, there are all kinds of trials. He doesn't give us a long list of what they could be. He simply groups them into this description, various kinds of trials. We face all kinds of them. And so this is a very important and relevant message, especially when you consider what is happening in our world today. And so it would be very unwise and unbiblical for us to assume that the Christian life is a carefree kind of life, assuming that everything is going to go smoothly for us in this world. And so James reminds us of the reality of suffering in the Christian life. But let me just say that this is not his main point. What James is saying and what's significant about this statement is that we should rejoice when we do have them. Now, most people will not have a problem when you say there's pain and suffering in the world. That's pretty obvious. Uh, they, would, they would affirm that reality. But to say that we are to consider it all joy would be different. Why? Because it is very unusual 
That's what some have described as paradoxical. It doesn't seem, it doesn't seem to fit. They ask, how in the world do you rejoice in trials? Because trials, by their very definition, seem to preclude any kind of rejoicing. They bring sorrow. They bring grief. They bring pain. They undermine everything that we are trying to have and accomplish in life. So the question is, how can we consider it pure joy? Well, James is not suggesting that we rejoice because we're hurting. He goes on to explain the reason that we are to rejoice. In verse 3, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance. And so it's not what they are, it's what they do. It's what they produce that is the reason for that response. Second, we should respond to trials by rejoicing because they reveal the nature of our faith. See, trials are God's agents of revealing the true nature of our faith. The trials are revealing agencies. They prove what is real and they show what is false. And James says it is our faith that is being tested now, let me just say that the testing of faith here is not intended to determine whether a person has faith or not. It is intended to purify faith that already exists. In other words, if you have true faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, you would be able to obey this command. And remember, this epistle was written to Jewish Christians. They have been saved by the grace of God. The Holy Spirit is in them. And so, by the grace of God and by the power of the Holy Spirit, and through His Word, they have everything they need to be able to rejoice in the midst of trials. Steve Cole gave this illustration that helps us understand that point. He said, you can buy a jacket that claims to be waterproof. If you wear it on dry days, you have not put the jacket to the test. The test of that jacket is, if you get caught in a downpour, does it keep you dry? If it does, you say, that's a real waterproof jacket. Similarly, in the Christian life, we know that a lot of people can easily say that they believe in God or they believe in Christ. Anybody can say that. But you see, the test of your faith is when you really choose to trust in God during a severe trial. Now, I'm not saying that we don't waver in our faith when those moments come. When you read the Psalms, you can see how God's people often struggled in times of adversity. They cried out to God for mercy. A lot of times they questioned God and asked God why they were experiencing something like that. But in the end, they chose to trust God even if they did not have all the answers. So why were they able to respond that way? Well, it's because they have real faith in God. So the point is, when we are faced with a trial, and some of you might be experiencing a trial in life right now, well, you have a choice. Will I trust God in the promises of His Word as I have professed to do or not? You see, to trust God and experience His hope and joy in the midst of trials is a radical attitude that James wants us to adopt. And that leads us to the third point thing I want you to know in this verse. We should respond to trials by rejoicing because they help us develop endurance. Knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance. Now, endurance means to stand fast or persevere. It is not something that develops automatically. We must work at it. Thus, when we encounter trials, we should understand this reassuring truth. 
that our sovereign God is using it to develop enduring faith. See, when your faith is tested and when you pass the test, you gain endurance. You grow in the strength of your faith. Now, the ESV translates uh, the word in endurance to steadfastness. It says, For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And I bring that up because I think this is a better translation because the word steadfastness underscores the fact that this is not a passive virtue, but a steady clinging to the truth within any situation. Now, it is an engaged waiting. I know this is a concept that is foreign to our culture. We want things fast, right? We want things to be done immediately. We don't have the patience to wait. And I want you to know, guys, that this pandemic actually gives us the opportunity to cultivate this quality of perseverance, of steadfastness when facing difficulty. I know most of us can't wait to do the things uh, we're so accustomed to doing before. Maybe some of you want to travel again uh, and, you know, just do the things that you enjoy doing. But I want you to be patient. I want you to know that God is trying to develop you at this particular time. You see, if we keep on grumbling and complaining, we will miss the opportunity to cultivate endurance in our Christian lives. See, the life of William Carey, I believe, is a great example in this regard. He is considered to be the father of modern missions, and he wanted to translate the Bible into as many Indian languages as possible. He established a large print shop in Sirampur where translation work was done. And so William Carey spent many hours uh, and many days translating scripture. And by the way, when he was in the mission field, uh, he experienced a lot of trials one of which was his wife experiencing a nervous breakdown. She became insane. And when William Carey would uh, translate uh, the Bible into the Indian language, uh, oftentimes his wife would, would rant and rave in the next room. Now one night, his print shop where the Bible's were being printed burned to the ground. Yet Carey persevered and went forward and accomplished his goal. The secret of Carey's success is found in his steadfast determination. He once wrote, There are grave difficulties on every hand and more are looming ahead. Therefore, we must go forward. So when faith is tested, then the immediate result is or should be steadfastness. But valuable as it is, perseverance is not itself the goal of testing. James moves on, expanding the purpose of steadfastness because he has something greater in mind. Let's take a look at verse 4. And let steadfastness have its full effect that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Now, by a perfect man, James did not mean a sinless man, but rather one who is mature. Warren Wearsby said, The epistle of James was written to help us understand and attain spiritual maturity. James used the word perfect several times, a word that means mature. And let me also note that the word complete suggests the idea of wholeness and soundness. And so in this context, perfection is not just a maturing of character, but a rounding out as more and more parts of the righteous character are added. And that leads me to my last point. We should respond to trials by rejoicing because they foster spiritual maturity. In other words, what James is saying is when trials come, and these trials are often difficult. When that happens, 
don't resist. Don't rebel. Don't question the wisdom and the goodness of God. Don't be like Jonah. Instead, you need to remain steadfast. It's about remaining faithful. That the perfect work that God is doing through these trials is accomplished. We're made whole and we're made mature. Amy Carmichael once penned these thoughts. Sometimes when we read the words of those who have been more than conquerors, those who are spiritually mature, we feel almost despondent. We say, I feel that I shall never be like that. But they won through step by step by little bits of wills, little denials of self, little inward victories by faithfulness in very little things. They became what they are. No one sees these little hidden steps. They only see the accomplishment. But even so, those small steps were taken. Now, if someone were to ask you, what is your goal for 2021? What would your answer be? Would it be security? Regain the losses that were incurred during this pandemic? Weight loss, or maybe you want to travel again? What are your goals for the next year? I hope your goal is to become a spiritually mature Christian. Now, spiritual maturity is so important because it is what compels a person to develop strong convictions and then to pursue those convictions with tenacity without swerving. A mature Christian will not be swayed by opinion polls. He will not be swayed by peer pressure or even outright persecution. But a mature Christian will simply submit himself to God. Steve Cole notes, Submitting to God does not necessarily mean passively enduring it without praying for relief. Paul prayed that God would remove his thorn in the flesh. He stopped praying when God told him, My grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. And so being submissive to God does not necessarily mean that we do not take steps to remedy the problem. If the trial is the loss of a job, it is right in dependence on the Lord to seek another job. If the trial is an illness, it is right not only to pray but to seek medical help. If it is a difficult circumstance, it is not necessarily wrong to try to change the circumstance. So what then is biblical submission? Well, it is an attitude toward God where we do not defiantly shake our fist in His face and tell Him that He has no right to do this to us. We are not submitting to Him if we ignore Him and take matters into our own hands. And by the way, when a Christian is spiritually mature, he will not only submit himself to God, but he will also possess the character strength of gratitude. You see, a mature Christian will remain grateful to God despite the many trials he might be experiencing in life. And that's because he knows these trials are still better than what he deserves. He knows he deserves to be punished because of his sins. He knows he deserves hell. But because grace has been shown to him, because God has saved him, as he placed his trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, he knows everything that he will experience in life is simply because of God's goodness and grace. Even the trials, even the difficult circumstances, he will affirm that God remains to be good even when God allows those things to happen to him. Because he knows at the end of the day, the goal in the Christian life it's not to lead a comfortable life. The goal in the Christian life is conformity to the Lord Jesus Christ. And so a spiritually mature Christian will welcome adversity. He will embrace suffering as a way to grow in Christ-likeness. 
And so if gratitude is a sign of spiritual maturity, let me say that ingratitude denotes spiritual immaturity. Infants can serve as a good illustration here because they do not always appreciate what parents do to them. They have short memories. Their concern is not what you did for me yesterday, but what you are doing for me today. And of course, infants, they love milk. If they're hungry, they're going to let you know by crying, right? The past is meaningless, and so is the future. They live for the present. But those who are mature, those who are spiritually mature, are not like infants. They deeply appreciate those who labored in the past. They recognize those who labor during the present and provide for those who will be laboring in the future. And they count it all joy when they meet trials of various kinds because they know that when their faith is tested, it produces steadfastness that eventually leads to spiritual maturity. And they obey the Lord willingly because they love Him and because they are devoted to Him. One of my heroes in the faith is a man named Adoniram Judson. And I think his life exemplifies that kind of devotion. Judson uh, served in Burma as a missionary for almost 40 years. In 1834, he became the first person to translate the Bible into Burmese. Judson's Burmese translation was finally published in 1835. It was a major accomplishment for a man who arrived in Burma in 1813, not knowing a single word of the Burmese language. He devoted the last years of his life to writing the English Burmese dictionary. Uh, the Burmese English half was halted, however, when he developed a serious lung infection. And the doctor prescribed a sea voyage as a cure. It was to no avail, and so on April 12, 1850, he died on board the ship and was buried at sea in the Indian Ocean. He spent he had spent 37 of his 61 years of life in service abroad with only one home leave and inspired countless young people to follow his example. He once said, the motto of every Christian, whether preacher, printer, or schoolmaster, ought to be devoted for life. He went through a lot of suffering while he was in Burma, but he was there because he was devoted for life. He considered his trials as joy because he knew that it was through them that God was developing his character. His joy in his trials is not pleasure, but rather eschatological anticipated joy. In other words, he rejoiced not because he suffered, but because he knows that his suffering is preparing him for the anticipated return of Christ. That is why Paul says in 2 Corinthians 4, 17, for this light momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison as we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. Let us pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we once again praise and thank you for allowing us, O oh Lord, to be reminded of this very important truth that not only are trials inevitable in the Christian life, but they are opportunities for us to develop endurance, steadfastness, that eventually causes us to become spiritually mature. Lord, I pray that if there is anyone watching this who is going through a trial as a Christian, may you comfort him right now. 
and may you use your word to instruct him on how he or she is to respond to this trial. And for those of us, Lord, who might not be experiencing a trial right now, we know, Lord, it's just a matter of time. We live in a very broken and imperfect world and suffering and pain is part of life. So I pray, Lord, that you would use your word to prepare us so that when those trials come, not only will we see things from a biblical perspective, but we would allow them, Father, to transform us and make us spiritually mature Christians. For the glory of your name, in Jesus' name, amen. Church, may the God of endurance and encouragement grant you to live in such harmony with one another in accord with Jesus Christ, that together you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ.